but we started off, I think it was in the 70s, that I was teaching school, Joe was a hydraulic engineer research scientist, but we both knew that eventually we wanted to help children learn about history of the local area. So we thought about it a long time. And then in the 80s, a friend and I went to Frankstown to James Frank's Museum near Boonville and asked him about a sorghum mill. He didn't have a sorghum mill, but he said he had other things. And we wound up buying quite a few things from him. And then after he died, we went back to the estate sale and bought some more things. He had been the blacksmith in Barn Burning. He had been in one other Faulkner movie. And he had rented or leased a lot of his things from the museum to the uh, movie industry. And they were actually used in Faulkner movies. So we bought a lot of things from him at that time. And that really started the basis. We didn't have a building, we didn't even have land. And at first we thought we would rent storage. And we saw how expensive that would be until we finally found this place and it had a barn. So we enclosed the barn way out and uh, used it for storage. And then eventually in the 19, about 1990, Joe started building this, my husband started building this building. And it was a one man operation. He had the concrete put down, the cedar poles up here, we actually cut on my school grounds at Bramlett in the city schools. And he cut the trees, put them up there with his uh, tractor, and I peeled the bark off with my drawing knife. So everything here has been the cheapest way that it could possibly be made for us to have our dream. And even the ceiling, all of this, Joe put up by himself. So, I mean, he really did a lot of hard work getting it done. Surrey in the back that has the canopy over it, that was used in Faulkner movies. And the buckboard back behind there was used. If you see the movie tomorrow, William Faulkner movie tomorrow with Robert Duvall, uh, the buckboard back there was actually the one that the bad guys used to abduct the little boy and carry him off. So that was the buckboard and it has one wheel bigger than the other so you can actually tell that's the one it was. Uh, then a lot of the things over here were used in Faulkner movies. Uh, if you see the movie tomorrow in the very opening scene and the ending scene, it will have a lady who goes by pushing a baby carriage and a black man is out doing his roller cob organ. Well, the roller cob organ is down in the shelf here and the baby buggy is the one back in the back. So those were actually used in the movie tomorrow. Uh, we have a lot of other things from this that were used in the movie tomorrow, and you may want to take time to look at some of this. This is, uh, it shows some of the scenes. This is Robert Duvall. That's the actual little baby cradle that it looked like he was making, but James Franks actually made it. But th that is the actual cradle. This shows where the little boy went up and looked at the tombstones where his mother had been buried. Those are the actual tombstones or markers there. They're not stones, grave markers that were used in the movie tomorrow. Uh, the big, um, what do you call those things? That The big uh, thing at the top of buildings. Okay, that, yeah. That was actually used, that came from the jail in Oxford where Intruder in the Dust was filmed. So that shows up real well in that movie. And the 
little round thing with the round hole in it over in the center of that room. That's called a keyhole. See a great big key. It looks like a keyhole. Okay, that was the very top of the old jail in Oxford that was in Intruder in the Dust. Isn't that neat? And then we have quite a few of these around that were used, that came from the jail, that were, that show up in Intruder in the Dust. And the uh, chair rail in the back, that way back in the back, uh, that was actually from the old jail, the upstairs, and I think downstairs too, they had it around that. I think one of the neatest things we have is this wagon right here that was used in the movie Tomorrow. Robert Duvall and the little boy that he was keeping, his stepson I guess is what it was, uh, <clears throat> were picking cotton. It looked like they had that full of cotton and they were playing on the back of it but there was not much cotton in it. It was the wrong time of the year. So it has a false bottom in it, which means they put plywood up so high and then just a little bit of cotton. So that still has the false bottom in it. Uh, and <clears throat> when we wanted to buy that, but we didn't have enough money, we were poor folks and we still are, but, <laughs> but we, when we were talking with the James Frank's about buying that, he said, well, it would be $250 because it shows up well in the movie. We didn't have $250, so we saved and I made uh, spam casseroles and all kinds of things, so <laughs> save my money. We go back over and he says, well, since you're just buying one thing, it's going to be $500. So we didn't buy it. And we waited, and after he passed, we went to the auction, and there were a bunch of men around in their overalls. And when they started bidding on that, they said, 20, 25, 30. I said, 65, and they would not bid against the old woman. <laughs> and I got it for $65. The table here is actually the table that was used in the movie tomorrow right up here it shows Robert Duvall sitting at the table this is James Franks and we have the mannequin that looks like him over there that shows the the lady with the little uh, baby buggy and this shows the buckboard right at the back that has the little boy that was abducted this is called a an outside kerosene lantern or light right at the very back there. It has kerosene in it and you light it at the bottom and it makes a light and the kerosene goes down to it. And that was actually used in that movie right here. It shows Robert Duvall lighting it. You should have seen us when we were taking one of the hearses to Memphis to the, uh, not the Pink Palace Museum, to Brooks Art Gallery for a big showing that they had of Savad, and I can tell you about that. Uh, but we actually carried the hearse all the way up there, and Joe had on his tuxedo, and I had on a black dress. And we stopped at midnight at uh, to to get a sandwich on the way home. Somebody won't know if we were on our honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> had the hearse behind us. <laughs> I told him yes, and it had been lasting for 50 years. <laughs> but I think it would probably be a good idea to go, on. oh, the uh, pink and green little cafe type seat back there, that was used in John Leslie's um, drugstore. We call them drugs now. but the, it's not supposed to be drug anymore, it's pharmacy. Uh, but, but that was used there, and William Faulkner would go in every morning and have coffee there. 
So the Leslie family actually saved that one seat because that was the one that William Faulkner always sat in. And they had stored it in a chicken house out Highway 6 East. And they got ready to make the highway better and the people had to get rid of it. So they had a sale and we were able to buy that. So we felt real lucky that. Well, both, but it was a passion. Uh, we would go to estate sales, uh, flea markets, garage sales, just whatever. And sometimes people just told us what was available. The main thing we wanted was to find local things as much as we could, not have things from New York or somewhere like that. So we tried to make sure that we had as much local stuff as we could because that was our goal, was to help the children learn about their own culture. The ticket station right here, that little black brown thing right there, that came from the Lyric Theater, and that's where the movie Intruder in the Dust, the premiere for it. You'll have to and excuse my mess. Story on everything. Just about it. So and if I don't... That is a steel guitar that was made in parchment. Oh my gosh. That's what I love. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Do you have any more parchment? I've got a, a purse down in my tacky stuff, I think it was. Did I borrow that? And, and I think I've got some knives that were just steel blades and they put tape around them, but I don't know, Eddie may have those. I don't know where they are. Eddie loves that stuff too, so. But yeah, you can borrow, you know you can, anything I've got. All right, when we go into the next area, See, I had school children to come for field trips for 17 years. And then we started thinking, well, instead of school children, we got so interested in Native American things until gradually we stopped having school children come and we started doing more things with Native Americans. So I've actually had Choctaws to come out and spend the night with us and my best friend, is a Homa Indian from Homa, Louisiana, but she is the Director of American Indian Research and Studies at the University at Southern. And she also teaches statistics. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's in the psychology department where they teach both things. So, uh, and she's going to come up in September she has been invited up to Ole Miss to give a presentation in September. This is what I always told the school children. Look behind the curtain, but do not tell anybody what you see. I want it to be a surprise for them too. <laughs> the only thing, one day one little boy looked back there and he came out and announced real loudly what it was. I said, oh, you weren't supposed to tell anybody. I didn't, I was just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, like we've got washing and ironing in this mm -hmm. one, so we've tried to kind of separate them the yeah. best we could yeah. on it. Uh, this, these are two bathtubs. You could actually take the bathtub and roll it up on rollers and take it to the next room. Mm -hmm. But what would happen, it would be more like this, and you'd put the water in the tank up above. It would have kerosene, you could heat it. Put the water in there. The mother would take a bath, she'd give the baby a bath, then the daddy would take a bath in the same water, and then all the children would take baths in the same water. And then the children would have to take the 
bucket, take the water, put it on plants. Yeah, no waste. No waste at all. And I think this is the hot water heater also that you could roll from one room to the next. And then there are washing machines back there that you'd have to take a lever and make it work. This is the old ringers that you could take and use. Uh, and then of course they had just the old wash tubs where you'd put your rub board in and, and use it that way. Uh, but a lot of times the people would use the pot and they would actually boil their clothes because usually you took your bath on Saturday night, you put on clean clothes for Sunday morning, yeah. and you wore them all week, yeah. the same clothes. And so they would boil the clothes to make them be cleaner yeah. and use lye soap. And then the socks would shrink because they were usually made out of wool. And they weren't necessarily the same color, so you. Your socks might look like, this is a pair of socks right here. That's a natural pair of socks. And, but they'd shrink when you boiled them. So this would be the size that you would want that sock to be. And they would take the sock and put it on the sock stretcher. And then when it dried, it would be the right size for you. So they would use that. The irons, would have numbers on them. This iron weighs four pounds. This one weighs eight pounds, no, six pounds. This one is eight pounds. This one is 22 pounds. This was for a tailor, uh, a man who would make men's suits. And so he would have to have a real heavy one to press the sleeves and cuffs and things like that. Uh, these are called salesman samples. Instead of the salesman taking around all of these irons, he would take one like this and he'd say, you can buy the, an iron that looks just like this from two pounds all the way up to 22 pounds. And you would order it and tell him what you wanted and the next time he came, he would have the right iron for you. So it, salesman samples, are really more expensive than the others because there were not as many of them made. Is there another name? Were they ever called dog irons or is there another name for them? I don't know why they would, <laughs> but I, I, wait a minute. Those go in the fireplace for logs to go on, don't they? <laughs> I think that's right. These are little tiny salesman samples that you can you take this off and heat the bottom part of it, but not the handle. And I've got some bigger ones of that over there also. Well, right here is one where you can actually take, oh, I can't get it off. But anyway, you'd take this part out and heat this. You'd have two or three of these and you'd heat one while you're using the other one. And then when that one got cool, well, you'd put it at the fire and get the other one to put on. And we actually have that uh, water yoke. That was actually used back in the 17 and early 1800s where people had to go to the spring and get water and carry it to make their water. And the reason we have it in there when we had school children coming, we wanted them to know what a rope bed was so we've got a rope bed in there, and if you've ever heard the expression, sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite, you sleep tight because your rope are tight. But this is just general conglomeration. Oh my goodness, she lost her hair back there. <laughs>
these are things that were Native Americans. My husband and I both were from Neshoba County, Mississippi. That's where we were born and raised. And we both have ancestry, I think. that That's just the things are not level. Uh, my husband's ancestry goes back to the Choctaws. Mine, oh, well, it's Choctaw too, but I didn't know it. I thought it was Cherokee until I did a lot of research, but it's really Choctaw. She actually got a land grant in the early 1900s as a Choctaw. So, but Joe's family, if any of you have ever seen Marty Stewart on television, okay, Marty Stewart and Joe were cousins and they have the same Choctaw ancestry. Uh, this, Jill, I bet you didn't know this. This is called a feather basket. I, we always called it a laundry basket because it, you know, we thought it was to put laundry in, but the Indians actually used it like for uh, eagle feathers and uh, red tail hawks. They put the feathers in that. So, uh, this shows different designs on here. Uh, this is the rattlesnake design. See the rattlesnake with the diamond back rattler. Uh, this is a chain stitch right here. This is the stairways to heaven. See how it looks like it's going up? And also, they have the different dyes that they use to make those. So that was important to them. This is called a rabbit stick. Some of them actually called it a magic stick because when you throw it like this, it would curve around and come back to you like a boomerang. So but it was to hit rabbits and small animals on the ground. This is what they used to play chunky. They had a little ball that they would catch. They could not touch the ball with their hand, but they could hit somebody over the head with it. They could do anything they wanted to, and their goal post was a tree here, and the other one may be four miles away. What we tried to do was have this side so it's prehistory. This is the way the Indians would have dressed and looked and what they would have used before white people came. And the one starting right here is what the Choctaws and so on used what they for festivals mostly now. And this was actually used by one of the, well, Tammy's son, Kalik, for one of his uh, festivals, shirts. These were all made by the Choctaw women. Every one of these were. So there, we would go to the pawn shop after the ball games, especially. If that team didn't win, well, they would take in all their things and sell them. The Indians actually brought the gourds with them from Asia up through, up to the Bering Strait and on down. And it was much warmer then, so from what we understand, they actually used those and brought them with them. If you, if you read about the Indians, the very first ones, they would, uh, their chief would come out and he would have singers that would come and he would follow the singers and they would place the mat for him to sit on. That's one of the mats, the types of things that they would use. Isn't that pretty? We were in Florida and they had that thing for $15. And I don't think they knew what it was and I sure didn't tell them. I just bought, paid for it and got out of there. <laughs> But see, that's where a lot of the Indians actually lived. So, oh, and I'll tell you about this, even though it's probably not Indian, well, it is Indian related because the turkey here was one of the main um, things that they had for meat. One of our friends, Bruce Jenkins, was uh, um, a law enforcement. 
and he is retired now. And about a month ago, listen to this, about a month ago, they started seeing some of their little things disappear from their barn. And his wife saw somebody go in and get their saddle and put it in her car. And they, she told him to, she told the woman to drop it. Well, she got in the car and started off and Bruce came out and he told her to stop and he got in front of the car and she ran him down and ran over both of his legs with the car. And he had a gun. He shot the tires out of the car, even with his legs like that. And it did not put him in the hospital. He's still bruised. But I just, I think that is just a marvelous story. He actually gave us that. Yeah. So it means a lot to me for that reason. <laughs> Some of the clothes back there were actually worn in the ball games. I shouldn't, but I am. I just cannot resist. If I go to a thrift store especially, and I went to one uh, real good store with the other day and they had some, and I shouldn't have gotten them, but I did. But I love to. It's still in my mind. And Eddie loves it, and his family does. So I don't feel like I'm wasting myself too much on it. That's a family. Isn't that neat? That's really old. It's made out of, uh, I want to say beach. I think so. It, there's only one kind that will not split, and I think that's what that is. It, I think it's beach. Okay, this is the general store here. They said this is where you'd go to get your hair cut. <laughs> and if you got your hair cut, if you were sick, the barber could even bleed you. <laughs> that meant that your blood was bad, so he'd take some of your blood out. <laughs> and this was actually used for bloodletting. That's why it's red, so the blood wouldn't show up too bad. Uh, the broom holder back here, broom rack, is real unusual. And the round black thing over here is a Dutch oven. You'd put that in front of the fireplace and put your bread or whatever in there and the heat would radiate to it and cook it that way. If you see anything in here that you want to ask about, please. Okay, this actually has t tails like tools that would be in here, screws and that type of thing. So that every one of these open up so they little bins. What are the little columns? You have a lot of little curved things in that jar. Okay, those are made out of bamboo and they would have put banners on. Okay. Uh, it would be banners kind of like this, but an older variety of them. We've got those from a real old store. Well, they candled them. Uh, I don't know if that one I believe that's just to weigh them. I don't know. Well, yeah, it is. Just in them, I don't know, but uh, we also had something that would candle them so you could see inside if they had that. I don't know, but I love that story. We've got a groundhog that lives on the Barner Store Museum. His name is Clemson. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, that's great. <laughs> That's a booster chair. And of course, all the pots or slop jars or whatever you want to call them. I wish I could turn these lights on, but they flicker and don't look like they're doing right in here. So, this is a chiropractor's bed. What you would do here, you would put your feet here and your head up here and the chiropractor would stretch you real good, and make you get tall and straight. He'd say, do you feel better now? What are you going to tell him? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to tell him you need more, are you? And then this is the quack doctor's kit here. Most of you probably already know about that. but. Quack. With this, it has a lot of different instruments here. So this actually gives a purple light and it shocks you. <laughs> this is when electricity was first invented. And this one was to do your stomach, wherever you needed cheeks or whatever. This one was for your hair. And this one might be for your elbow or your neck. And you would pay the doctor. You would get shocked. The purple light would come on. And then he'd ask you if you feel better. Mm hmm <laughs> So. And it was called the Violent Ray Machine. And I think it was actually sold by Sears and Roebuck. If you've read any of William Faulkner's books, we tried to do this. Well, the mannequins here came from Lansky's Big and Tall. That's, that's where Peabody, Elvis. Uh huh. That's Dr. <laughs> Peabody. <laughs> uh, Lansky's Big and Tall is where uh, Elvis Presley went to buy all of his zoot suits, his fancy suits. And when he died, that's where they got the white suit he was buried in, was from Lansky's Big and Tall. Well, we went and Guy Lansky was selling a bunch of the things there. So we got that mannequin and a lot of the taller mannequins, especially black mannequins, because a lot of the mannequins were black. And that's where we've gotten most of our black ones. Uh, but we dressed him up like Dr. Peabody. And this one, uh, I think this chair actually came from the Ole Miss Infirmary. So, um, this is called a birthing table where a baby would be born. This is also a birthing table, but that one would be used in uh, a, a wagon when the doctor went to the doctor's buggy, he would take that with him when he was going out in the country. And that has, they said, probably 500 adjustments, all kinds of things that you can adjust in there. So it was used that way. Uh, this is the old dentist stuff over here. And the dentist drill, you would have to pedal it to make it work. And like the torture chamber. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Baker said that in the Korean War, he was in the Korean War, and he said that the, uh, he was a dentist then, and he said that whoever was the soldier that needed to work, the one right behind him was the one that pedaled. He said, you're talking about pedaling as fast as they could because when it was their turn, they wanted somebody to pedal fast for them. So. But actually, the electricity or the power was by pedaling. So he said it was really uncomfortable. The bed all the way in the back was from Pontotoc County. I can't remember the name of the doctor we bought that from in Pontotoc. Uh, 
but it has one hook on it, and they said that the only IV that you had back then was blood transfusion. So it's got that one hook for blood transfusions. And the reason it was up so high was because that's where the, it wasn't adjustable, so they had to have it up higher so you could take care of the patient that way. Nelson's department store is still in Oxford, and they claim to be the oldest department store in the state. Back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, up until the 60s, they actually used these showcases all that are all around here. And uh, we had a friend who was working up there, and he told us that they were getting ready to get rid of them and put in more modern ones. So Joe contacted him, uh, and they said that they wanted to take one to the school. Joe said, well, I will do that if we can buy the rest of them. So that's the way we got these. Super. <laughs> and when I was teaching school, uh, this memory is rather than anything else, but this little outfit over here, I would wear that uh, at the end of the year. If the child had read 50 books, they were invited to the 50s party. And I mean, the books could be just three or four pages. They could almost be a picture book if the child wasn't able to read. But every child in my room always read their 50 books. And Joe would take the Cadillac limousine down there, put on his chauffeur's uniform, and he would put the kids in it and drive them around a couple of blocks. And the little girls would always fight over who was going to carry my purse. <laughs> felt like you work when you got through with it. I've had many of those. Well, I always had to have a permit. Oh, yes. All right, my aunt was a beautician. She lived on 34th Street, 8th Avenue in Meridian. That almost downtown Meridian. She lived in a great big white house and one of the back rooms was her beauty shop. So starting when I was probably a year and a half old, I would go about every six months and have to have a coal, a, a, a hot wave permanent. And Aunt Carrie would always use these things. She would um, start off by rolling your hair on this then putting this on it, and then attaching it to this, and it would get extremely hot. And she would sit there with a fan and just fan and fan and fan and put cotton around my ears and so on because it would burn otherwise. I mean, and it smelled horrible. But that's the reason I have this is because I remember Aunt Carrie and her permanence. This one right here. Uh, they're actually uh, shoe shops, shoe stores. Yeah, that's where you go and you put your foot up on there for them to measure. Okay, this is little stools from a shoe shop. And you would actually, they would put your foot on here and measure how big your foot was. That would tell what size shoe you needed. Uh, this is a gout stool right here. If you had gout, your big toe, you know, got sore, well, that was to relieve the pressure on the gout. Um, next door to Nelson's department store was a store that uh, 
May's children, ladies and children, ready to wear. May Vines actually had a shop there. It's, I think, where the tourism is now. I can't, no, no, it's where uh, the bookstore for children is. Um, it used to be the tourism. But May Vines, this was her pilgrimage dress. This is a mannequin from her store, and the bonnet was actually used by May Vines. So that whole thing, to me, represents Miss May Vines. If you notice the uh, the black man and the taller, well, those two men over there, those all came from that landscape, big and tall. I thought I had a sign up in the middle there, but it undoubtedly has come down. So, Okay, this is sewing and weaving. Uh, this is an old 1854 sewing machine that was used in this county at Lafayette Springs back in the early 1800s, 1700s. They actually had springs like uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas and you could pay and go to the hotel and, and soak in the springs and Lafayette Springs was actually used for that purpose. This sewing machine was from there. It does not have a bobbin. It makes a stitch like a, a, a sack stitch. So that was actually used there before bobbins were used on machines. Some of our ancestors actually made flat, uh, grew flax, and that's what linen is made from. So some of our stripper, flax stripper and machines back there were used to make um, linen. I think this is a real unusual spool cabinet made like a, a spoon. I don't those. think so. Uh, That's where I think we may have one of the school or something down near the school area. Uh -huh. I've looked for pictures on the Bay Spring. That's where my family went to church and everything forever. Oh, at the well, Baptist bet, church. you just remind me and I'll try to help you find something then. I just, I think that must have been a wonderful place. It must have been, yeah. I took a sewing class at the Botan. Um, when the school kids came, one little boy said, oh, I know who that is. I thought he was gonna say Elvis. He said, that's Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> what this is. Uh, Rebecca something. It's a, an old emblem, kind of like the uh, Masons, yes, but it the was Rebecca's. for the women. Yes. Okay. I don't, but it, I think I, I looked it up on the internet and I think it said Rebecca. Yeah, I knew there was a group called Rebecca. But see, it's on, it was mm -hmm. used, I think, in a parade or yeah. that type of thing. Didn't know when we got it. But I love mouse traps. I love, I love giant mouse and giant and giant. <laughs> Somebody must have made that at Old Miss mm -hmm. for a project. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the mouse traps, especially. That's a spam mm -hmm. container over there yeah. that has is made into a mouse trap. I don't think do as many as eight, but usually it was four. And they would actually be longer on down to here. Uh, it, 
from Mr. James Franks. It came from Corinth, Mississippi. It was actually used at a big plantation in Corinth. Uh, you, the, and you can see right here and here where the slaves would have walked across. Yeah. Mm. So there were two at the time that would walk across and it was like a sorghum mill. And this has a big piece of metal under here, shaft, then the wooden shaft here. And by the time it gets all the way down here, it's going real fast. Um, they would put wheat or whatever they wanted in at one end and at the other end it would come out threshed. So it was a threshing machine. The Cadillac limousine here is a, that is a black Cadillac limousine, 1967, I think. But it was used in Great Balls of Fire with Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was used by Dennis Quaid. He was the one that starred in it. Uh, Uh, we already had it. We had bought it from the Alumni Association at Ole Miss. And they kept calling and calling, and Joe told them no, 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 because they were filming in Memphis, and he didn't want them to drive it to Memphis. They finally said they would lease it, put it in a warehouse, make sure it was well taken care of. And Joe finally told them okay, and I think they paid $150 was all they paid. But Joe made sure that they did take care okay. of it. And the only thing that they did, it has an ooga horn on it, and that shows up in the movie. Also, uh, Dennis Quaid and the lady in the red dress crawled in through the back window, and that shows up in it. And there's a dent over the window, so it shows the dent that it's actually that vehicle. Uh, the only thing they changed on it, it had a red carpet for the liner in the trunk, and they sprayed that black. So that was the only thing they changed on it. I've got the VHS movie, at Great Balls of Fire, and I had a good friend who worked with Jerry Lee for a while, and he signed it for me, and I've got it. Oh! So wow! Yeah. He walked out, he had on his... It's a killer. <laughs> he had killer in him. And he walked up to me and he went, How you doing, baby? <laughs> <laughs> How cute. My uh, son and I went to visit my mother and father in Neshoba County. And near there, one of my distant cousins had this park in a kudzu patch and it just had holes all in it. Uh, he told us he would sell it for $500. So we called Joe and he, Joe said yes. So Eddie and Joe spent time and they didn't really restore it, but they yeah, patched it yeah. up. And Eddie used that when he was a teenager. That was his car. <laughs> and the whole town knew it as Dolly. If you notice right here, that was Dolly. <laughs> So everybody in town would ask about Dolly. <laughs> uh, this is one of the, I think, neatest things that we have. This is a silver bell. It's actually made out of silver. And when you ring it, it rings a lot louder than any other bells that I know of. See how it just keeps ringing? Yeah. So that's the reason it was made out of silver for that reason. Uh, all of these are things that were used in uh, the um, train, railroad stuff. A lot of it came from Water Valley. That is where Casey Jones had his last stop before he had his train wreck and was killed. No, those are part of the railroad stuff. They are called uh, mail catchers. Yeah. They would have uh, just a big 
thing outside and put the mail on. Uh, in a bag. Yeah, in bags. And then this would be to catch the bag as, so they didn't even stop the train. They just caught it. And so that and this one over here are mail catchers. You know about it. That's Good for you. I've got some in the house. Uh, Shara Owen mm -hmm. uh, went to, well, she goes just about every year to uh, the wildlife thing in Pigeon Forge. Mm -hmm. And I've been with her, and they taught us how to make divining okay. rods and how to use them. Okay. Well, do you find water or graves or what? What is it that you divine? I have read up on it, and from what I understand, it's probably the mineral content. Okay. So that if you're going over a grave, it would have a different mineral content okay. than the other places around it, or the water would have a different mineral content. Because, you know, there's a lady here in town that can do that. Oh, I believe uh, in it. One of the girls here, Kathy, is working on uh, uncovering and doing the history on the oldest cemetery in Union County, and she's come there and found some I believe in it. Well, now, well, you need to talk to Shara too. Uh, he actually used two metal rods, put them in your hands, and walk, but I couldn't make it work for me. I don't know if it was my mentality or I was holding it too tight or what. Got tired of walking slow. I can't walk slow anyway. <laughs> That's uh, Morris Code Telegraph. This uh, huckster truck, which means peddling truck, was actually used in the movie Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which was a mini series on television. That children still, all of these books are Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. It's a real popular book for school children. And they would put things like turnips, eggs, all that kind of stuff in the back and take it down the streets where people lived, like a peddling truck, but it was in town. This was also made by Hardy Phipps. They have fangs instead of teeth. They straight down. See? That even makes me hate them more. <laughs> me too. Well, and I used to want to mash them, but if you mash it, you just, yeah, Joe would get them and thump them, yeah. but half the time he'd thump them on oh, me. <laughs> so I would have a screaming fit. Um, this can up here that has the three little nozzles on it. That is a kerosene lantern that is homemade just out of a can. Um, the peddling wagon here was made by James Franks. His grandfather had used it at, around Boonville, around Frankstown. Uh, so that was many years ago, probably 150 years ago. And he said they would take, uh, they would put cured meat up here in the front, put snuff and things like that in the back. And if somebody wanted to buy something but they didn't have anything, then they'd barter chickens for it. Okay. And so they would put chickens or ducks or geese or whatever in there. And then somebody else maybe had had a fox to come in and eat their things, so they would sell them to somebody else. So it was more of a barter type mm -hmm. thing a lot of time. The barrels were used for things like sugar, salt, flour, anything along that line. This is a dog trot churn. A dog would walk up here and we always had one when the school children came. <laughs> Mine is not trained now. But it would actually 
churn butter and rock the baby in the cradle and do it both at the same time. When the school children came, we'd tell them that was a peddling wagon and they'd want to know where the pedals are. <laughs> so, and that is a Fordson tractor. That's the second year that a tractor was used to plow in the field. Before that, they were just carried out to the field and then a big pulley put on it so they would grind corn or do something on that order. Cabinet, that was uh, to ship coffins in. <laughs> We've got a lot of different kinds of churns. Uh, one of Joe's great-grandmothers, they said she came from South Carolina into Alabama and Georgia and so on. And they said she had a little churn and she was so proud of that until any time they were moving, the wagon was moving, she would put it between her legs and hold it real tightly so it wouldn't turn over or break. And it was a small one like this. But I think the neatest thing back here, and I'm going to see if anybody can tell me what this is. <laughs> You might be surprised. That's a blinder. Uh-huh. This is an ox blinder. So that if the farmer was uh, plowing the corn or the cotton or whatever, the oxen couldn't go around and eat all the corn. So this was to blind. This was to go over his eyes. And this would be where the mouth would be down here and the ears would go out here. And this is something that William Faulkner wrote about. Have you ever heard, as stubborn as a mule? Yeah. Well, a mule would not be stubborn the second time if you use this. Yeah. William Faulkner called it a nose twister. In other words, you go up the horse or the mule's nose and you twist it. It does not make it bleed, but it sure does hurt. And the next time they see it, they're going to do what you tell them to do. <laughs> so William Faulkner actually wrote about, I think the guy was from Texas and he came out with some horses and he was a horse trader. And the farmer went and got the uh, nose twister off the wall and straightened the mules out. <laughs> this hearse right here was used in the Channel 13 movies for nine and a half years when they had the horror movies on Saturday afternoon. You remember those? I never survived. We actually carried that hearse to Memphis to the Brooks Art Gallery when they had Savads of March uh, Festival. Uh, Savad was, Davis fell backward. Dick Lightman told Davis that he would either pay him $300 or a dollar a head if he would go and dress up as Savad at the fair. And he said he'd take the $300. Well, they had over a thousand people oh, to show oh, up. So from then on, he always took the head count. I'll come on back here. We call this the military room. Uh, we have some things that are not military, but most of it is. If you'll notice the three newspaper articles on the wall over there, they are telling about these two carts right here. This one, these two right here. These are were drawn by mules. They were used in World War I. In World War II, they were used at Camp McCain, at Duck Hill, near Grenada, to train soldiers before they went into battle. And the story that the man told us was that these had been used on the only battle in the U.S. fought on U.S. soil. We didn't buy him. We didn't believe him. 
but we went to uh, Mississippi State and we got copies of the newspaper articles. And it said, I think it's 11 people were put in prison for using these and what happened this is about 1942 Camp McCain Mississippi you had black soldiers come in start trying to date and flirt with the white women and you know what that would have been in 1942 in Mississippi uh, the fathers decided they were going to close down Camp McCain and get rid of those soldiers. So they came in with their squirrel guns and the soldiers got scared and they carried their machine gun and their machine cart up on Duck Hill and started firing back at the fathers. And the newspaper article says for 11 minutes the daddies and the soldiers fought against each other at Duck Hill. The soldiers wound up in prison, I think it was Leavenworth Prison, for using firearms without permission. And that's it. We would not believe it and we would not buy it until we got the information and actually did research on it. And then we went and these were outside with trees growing through them, just a mess. Hair wreaths over here, when people would die, and sometimes even when they were still alive, they would take locks of hair, usually from the back of the neck, and, and sometimes it was from the beard or wherever, and they would make flowers out of it, and that was before they had photographs. They would use that to commemorate. Dad was in the Navy from 1917, when he was 17 years old, he was born in 1900, until he retired in 1940. And then the war started, and they upped the age and they called him back in. And he got old enough he could retire, so he retired the second time. And then they upped the age, and they called him back in. So he joined the Navy, wound up three different times. And I was born in 1940, so I barely remember when he was in the Navy. But I think the, what I like to tell about him, uh, well, he lived to be 100, so I knew him well. Oh, my goodness. When he was uh, 21 years old, he was one of the ones chosen to escort the unknown soldier, the World War I unknown soldier from La Havre, France, all the way back to Washington, D.C. So he was one of the honor guards. When you see pictures of the honor guards on the ship, he was one of those honor guards to bring the soldiers, the body back. Uh, and these are Choctaws who were in the, most of them were in the army. And my best friend who is the Homa Indian, she was in the army. Uh, but these are Choctaws that we knew their descendants and they gave us the pictures to put up there. Uh, were they the, they had, well, they were talkers, they? If somebody asked you who the original code talkers were, you would probably say Navajo. Navajo. But the original ones were the Choctaws. They were really from uh, Oklahoma, but their fathers were from Mississippi, fathers and mothers. So what it was, it was in World War I, and the commanders heard the Choctaws talking to each other. And they had them to use, like instead of saying, a bomb or a hand grenade, they would say a hot potato, but it would be in Choctaw. And they were the original code talkers, but they had to sign saying they would never tell anybody about their language because they wanted to be able to use that same type of thing later on for other wars. 
And so the Navajos told about it, and they had movies made about it, but they were not the original code talkers. I think they have a program about that now, don't they? The Choctaw. Have a what? I think they do a program about that. Uh-huh, yeah. They are finally coming out a little bit about it. Uh, this is a collapsible or portable bathtub, and right up over this is a water bucket that's made out of uh, canvas, and then it has <coughs> the spigot on the bottom so people could take a shower. Ooh, it's going to be hot in here. How to turn the fan on. May not have a way, huh? This is where we had school children come for 17 years. We did a one room school. <coughs> First, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to 12th grade in this one room. We taught them the rules, and they spent the whole day where they had to actually be in a one-room school. They had, we had enough slates for every child to write on. They'd do their math. We had McGuffey readers for every child to read out of. Um, they had to write with quill and ink the golden rule. I mean, it was a full day. This is a collapsible cup that the little girls would drink out of. We made a buzz saw. Each child had one of these to take home with them. And then they each had one of the uh, golden rules, or this one right here. The Indians did this one. Even years later, we would see the children, and they would say that they framed the golden rule and had that and they, they, they still save the things that they had from here. What school? Retired from Oxford. Okay. I taught first, second, and third grade and remedial reading some in the city schools. We did uh, okay. third grade for 1860's classroom and we did 1860 because we wanted it just before the Civil War otherwise the schools were demolished. Uh, and then we did the Mississippi Indians, and somehow or other, both of us got sidetracked with the Mississippi Indians. Well, we did a lot of things with native plants. And my friend, best friend for, that's a home Indian, she has the medicine wheel garden on the campus at Southern, but she did not know native plants at all, but she wanted to learn. And in the process, we've gone to all kind of seminars and caves and all kinds of things together. Just thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, we called it the Yacht Batafa Heritage Museum because William Faulkner actually wrote about this county as being Yacht Batafa County. That was his name for it. But when we started doing research, that is the Choctaw Chickasaw word for land flat or furred, which means uh, delta type land. And so it was a Choctaw Chickasaw word rather than a Faulkner word. And so we named it that because it honored Faulkner things plus it honored the Native Americans. <laughs>